the Christian Church is facing an unprecedented crisis, one that threatens the very existence of the church itself. And the leaders have come together to try and figure out how they are going to deal with it. See, there was a time not all that long ago when the church and its message was at least considered socially acceptable. I mean, yeah, maybe not everyone agreed about everything the church was doing, but at least they saw it in a good light. But now, all of a sudden, that seems to be changing. Why, just recently, a church leader had a bunch of people who tried to cancel him because they found his views offensive. And as a result, the believers have been spooked. They're not sure they can really trust the institution of the church anymore, and they have set out to establish and live out the faith on their own terms. They, to use a word that has become popular lately, have been deconstructing their faith, basically tearing it all apart, examining every part to decide what they can do without and what, if anything, is worth keeping. Some are reassembling the faith in a new way, in a new place. Some of them have figured out the way to live out their faith in innovative ways, without the church structures that have traditionally been there. Some people are calling this an emergent way of being the church. And the odd thing is that this strange jury-rigged faith actually seems to be connecting with people that it has encountered. Despite the lack of traditional structures, usual ways of doing things, the message of Christ and his love and his grace is actually getting through to people. And this emergent type church has been seeing some growth. And yes, the traditional leaders of the church are concerned. Because you see, they have remained where they had been. And all this innovation and this growth, well, it's taken place without their leadership and their sanction. And so they're justifiably concerned about how these people might lead the faith off track. And they've gotten together to talk about what they should do. And for a while they give a lot of consideration about how to how they might be able to shut all of this down. I mean, maybe they could make a few statements, say that deconstruction will only get people condemned to hell, and that emergent churches aren't real churches. Maybe one of them, one who commands respect, could go out and rebuke these people for their free thinking and their innovation. There is much at stake. And so the arguments rage late into the afternoon. And after a while, they get so tired of arguing that they try, decide to try a different approach. They pause, and they pray, and they open their hearts to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And that is how they actually come up with a rather different plan. And they decide to send two of the most important leaders of the church, Peter and John, send them out to Samaria to lay their hands on the believers there so that the Holy Spirit can be seen as part of the work that they are doing out there. At the beginning of the book of Acts, the author of the book, the same person, by the way, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, tells us, he actually tells us how the story is going to unfold. He basically gives a summary of the plot of the book, and he places it on the lips of Jesus just before he ascends into heaven. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Jesus says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
And pretty clearly, in the writer's mind, these steps in the growth of the church and the expansion of its impact from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and beyond is simply inevitable. It's all bound to happen. And it's supposed to be a story of continual triumph and success. But here's the thing. It is easy to look at events in hindsight and see them that way as inevitable. But it is very different to actually live through those kinds of events and transitions. And I believe that if you read between the lines of the story, it's actually pretty clear that the early church experienced these transitions more than anything as crises and problems to solve. We see that very clearly as the church makes the jump to the ends of the earth, especially in the ministry and the preaching of the Apostle Paul. I mean, the church nearly tore itself apart trying to deal with the difficult questions that Paul's ministry raised. Questions like the keeping of the law, circumcision, eating blood, and animals sacrificed to other gods. So that was a very difficult tr transition, and in the same way, there seems to be no doubt that the church would have seen the tradition into Samaria as similarly problematic. You can understand why. The first Christians were Jews, and Jews and Samaritans did not agree about many things, especially not about religious matters. They had different scriptures, different ways of worshiping, even if the Jews maybe grudgingly admitted they worshiped the same God. So there seems to be no question that the leadership in Jerusalem where, according to the Gospel of, according to, the, to Luke, they had been left behind following the cancellation of Stephen the martyr, seems to be no question that they were concerned about what the Samaritans might do if they were allowed to co-opt the faith. So it seems likely that the apostles in Jerusalem debated about excluding the Samaritans from the church or maybe putting severe restrictions on them, they must have wanted to hesitate to allow them to live out their faith in the way that suited them most. And that's why what the apostles actually did is so important. We are told that they sent Peter and John, two of the most important leaders in the church, out to Samaria so that the people there might receive the Holy Spirit. And the giving of the Holy Spirit is a very, very important matter, <coughs> very important matter in the book of Acts. The author makes a great deal of the various manifestations of the Holy Spirit throughout his story. The gift of the Holy Spirit accompanied by signs and marvels such as the speaking in strange tongues accompanies every transition in the life of the church in this book. It is there on the day of Pentecost when the apostles are given their leadership and their authority. It is there when Peter for the first time in the, brings the gospel to a Gentile family. And the gift of the Holy Spirit means many things in this book, obviously. It is about power, it is about ecstasy, about bringing the community of the church all together. But I, I think more than anything else, it is also a, a sign of the power of the gospel to change people's lives, and it especially gives to the believers the power and authority they need to work out their faith in their context. Because they have the Spirit, the Christians can interpret the scriptures and the sayings of Jesus, and they have the power to determine for themselves how they can live out these truths. So the Samaritan problem 
really is one of the first challenges that faces the apostolic leadership of the church. And the question is simply, are they going to hold on to that power to define and control the way the faith is lived out, or are they going to allow others to share in that power? And they had all kinds of reasons not to do that, not to share. It must have seemed so much safer at the time. But because they did the right thing and they decided that the gift of the Holy Spirit could be shared, even with Samaritans, the church was able to enter into a new phase in its growth, which was really the beginning of them actually changing the world. Now, as I say, because the writer of the book of Acts sees all of this in hindsight, he just assumes it was inevitable. Of course, that's what they were going to do. But let me tell you something. In my experience with the church, we rarely have that much ease dealing with the transitions as we live through them. Oh, no, we gripe and we complain and we blame people who start to approach the life of faith in new or innovative ways. We try to do whatever we can to shut that down. And above all, we do not want to give it our blessing. I mean, even, even just a light summary of the history of the church is going to show you that. How many Christian groups down through the centuries have been persecuted and criminalized just for wanting to live out their faith in different ways. The Lutherans were rejected and persecuted by the Catholics for insisting on salvation by faith alone. The Mennonites believed that their faith would not allow them to fight in wars, and so they were killed or sent into exile. The Anabaptists wanted to celebrate baptisms a little bit differently from other Christians, and yes, the Presbyterians decided, among others, decided that they should be punished by being drowned. The list goes on and on. And so it's rather significant that in the book of Acts, when faced with the Samaritan problem, we are told that the church did otherwise. And all of this is very relevant to the church at this moment in time because the church is facing another Samaritan problem. For there are the reasons why many people today are no longer approaching the faith as they once did are many. And I'm sure you're aware of many of the trends. For one thing, we find ourselves living in an age where when people in general are just not very trustful of institutions. And so, the respect for the church as an institution in society is on the decline. And yeah, many have abandoned the institutional church entirely. Others have sought to develop non-institutional or even anti-institutional Christian practice. And yeah, the church often experiences this as a threat. At the same time, there's no question that the church has been damnless, damaged by endless stories of abuse. We've come to understand that incidents, incidences of, a, of abuse of power and authority, of, of sexual and physical assault, are all too common in the church. And people, yes, have suffered deeply as a result, have experienced trauma. And all of that has made people call into question the very organization of the church and, and theology and teaching that support it and that actually seems to allow these things to continue to happen. Others have come to the place where at least the traditional answers that churches have given to tough questions no longer work for them. They are tired of the rejection of scientific truths by some Christians. They are tired of the mistreatment of people who do not fit strict gender or sexuality roles. They have grown tired 
of the thinly veiled racism they have encountered in the church. These kinds of, of things are behind what has been called the deconstruction movement, which ends up with some rejecting faith entirely, while others attempt to hold on to parts of it as they reconstruct a faith that works for them. These are forces that have been war at work for some time now. But many of these effects have been accelerated by these strange times we've been living through for the last two years. Yes, the world has changed too much, too quickly. It has changed politically, socially, economically, and people simply cannot be content with how we have always done things. And it's not really that people have given up on faith in general. I mean, yeah, some have, but that's not actually the biggest issue. No, it's that people have learned ways of working out their faith in new ways, maybe without needing to rely on institutional supports, like buildings and authority systems and schedules. All of these things once considered so essential. So yeah, the church today is dealing with another Samaritan problem. And we can fight against it, and we can rail against innovation in different ways, different ways of being Christians. We can insist that being good Christians means that other people have to have conformed to our ideas and of how things are done. If that's what we do, it's possible the church will be left behind in Jerusalem while the real growth is taking place out there in Samaria. But what if the church did what the apostles did and acknowledged that the faith that is emerging does have the Holy Spirit working within it? What if we were to lay our hands on what God is already doing in Samaria and seek to support it? even at the risk of it costing in terms of what once once considered essential institutional supports for the church. I think these may actually be the most important questions the church is facing in our time. And I pray, I pray that we be open to the leadership of the Holy Spirit as we seek to answer those questions. Lord, our God, we thank you. Thank you for given us a Samaritan problem to deal with in the church today. It's actually a wonderful opportunity, though we may not experience it that way, may not feel that way. Help us to do the right thing. Amen.